Software Engineering Radio, Episode 10, Remoting Infrastructures, Part 2. This is the second part of the remoting infrastructures um, episode. Um, so in the last episode, we introduced the basic ideas of uh, remote communication using uh, message-oriented and remote procedure call middleware. We introduced the broker pattern that serves as the basis for RPC-based uh, middleware. And so in this episode, we take a look at the details um, along the lines of the patterns uh, described in the remoting patterns book. So I think, um, Michael, you start by explaining the client proxy, right? Yeah, the client proxy is what the, the client application sees from the communication middleware. And uh, the client proxy implements the same interface as the remote object and hides all the details of uh, serialization and dispatching and network communication to the client application. In case an error occurs, the client proxy is the one who communicates it back to the application logic. The client proxy uh, is a specialization of the proxy pattern introduced by the Gov patterns book. Okay, so, so the client calls a method on the proxy, thinks it calls a remote method. It actually does call the remote method. The proxy then magically, we'll explain how that works later, magically transports the invocation to the server. And what happens there? On the server, there is something we call the invoker. And that's uh, a component that accepts the, the request object, something that describes what the client wants from the server. It uh, receives this object and then dispatches the invocation to the remote object. And so if the remote object is just a normal language object, you know, assume you have the client that calls a say hello method and the server also has a say hello method in its server object, then the invoker is responsible for interpreting the data structure that transports the request over the network and then actually call the say hello method on the server object. On the client side, uh, if we go the, the stack one step down, below the client proxy is something that we call the requester. It follows our requester pattern. That requester encapsulates all the reusable parts that are not in the client proxy, which is specific to a sp certain remote object. So the requester needs uh, an absolute object reference to then tell the lower network layers to establish a connection to the server side. So try to illustrate that a bit further. The problem here is that the client proxy and also the server object have a specific signature, a specific interface, which you want to call natively. However, the communication middleware below it doesn't know about these specific interfaces. Otherwise, you would have to rebuild the complete middleware just, if you, just to, to be able to talk to a different uh, signature, to a different interface on the server side. So the, the requester's job is to translate the specific uh, signature, the specific method calls um, that you make on the client proxy into a generic object that can be translated over the network. And on the other side, the reverse thing happens. The invoker takes this generic data structure and kind of downcasts, I know it's the wrong term, but makes the specific, the interface specific call on the server side object. And to, to be able to do that, we need something that's called marshaller. The job of the marshaller is to, to take the, the request object, it's basically an object that says, call this method with those parameters on that object on the server. So, and this object has to be serialized into something that's uh, transportable over the network. This can be some uh, kind of IOP encoding for CORBA, it can be just Java serialization for RMI, it can be some XML angle bracket thing for web services. And so we have the marshaller on the client side and on the server side because on the client side the marshaller uh, transforms the request object into bits and bytes and on the server side, the marshaller uh, transforms the bits and bytes back into a request object. And on the for the return value, 
the same happens the other way around. The marshal on the server side takes the return value description object, turns it into bits and bytes, which the requester on the client then uh, re-establishes into an object. Okay, and at the lowest layer of the layered architecture, we have the client request handler and the server request handler. Um, they deal with how the data is put on the wire, how it is read from the wire, and dispatched, uh, for example, to the invoker on the server side, or the result um, to the requester on the client side. Here, um, patterns like reactor or leader follower are used for demultiplexing and dispatching of events. These are the components that make sure that the system is scalable and these kinds of things. Okay, the, the, the final part of this kind of basic set of patterns is the interface description. Obviously, if you want to be able to seamlessly talk to a remote object, you have to describe its interface in some way that doesn't only allow you as the application programmer to call um, the remote object, but the interface also has to be described in a way that the middleware can actually understand it and build or set up all the communications infrastructure. So the, the interface description describes uh, the interfaces, the operations, sometimes attributes, and the signatures of the operations, and also usually uh, the exceptions the operations can throw. And what usually happens then is that some kind of code generator reads the interface description and generates the client proxy. So um, application programmers just have to call out methods on it and the implementation is generated. Um, the same is true for the invoker, also sometimes called skeleton, the Corba world for example. And um, this invoker is also often generated from the interface description. There are other ways of uh, getting this uh, client proxy and invoker implemented, for example, in languages that uh, are more dynamic. You can, for example, build client proxies dynamically at runtime. For example, in Java, there is this dynamic proxy API where you can just call some Java API methods and pass in Java interface, and it implements on the fly a proxy implementation which you can then use as the client proxy. Same thing on the server. If there is a way to uh, invoke methods using reflection, for example, in Java, then you can implement the invoker generically. A nice example of what can be done dynamically is the Spring framework. There you can basically implement your application logic in what they call POJOs, plain old Java objects, and then you can declare using a configuration file that some objects have to be accessible remotely or that some object has to act as a proxy for a remote object. And then what Spring does during a system startup is it dynamically generates um, all the infrastructure that's necessary. And that's really quite cool. What, what happened in the last couple of years is that the, remote, uh, the reflection mechanisms of mainstream languages have become so fast that using reflection is not a big performance problem anymore. This is different, of course, in embedded systems where you need to be deterministic with regards to how many processor cycles or instructions you use for something. But in you know this general purpose enterprise web blah, blah, blah development, it's absolutely feasible to use dynamic proxies, dynamic invokers, and all that stuff. One last point there, another trend that started in the last two years or so is that there is this middle uh, path between statically generating source code and doing everything dynamically, and that is that you, at runtime, on the fly, generate bytecode, Java bytecode, for example, uh, to represent the proxies using libraries like cglib or something like that. So that doesn't require a specific source code generation step, but on the other hand, it also doesn't use dynamic implementations. It, it on the fly generates the bytecode that then is used as if it would have been um, statically generated. So, so Michael, what are the consequences of intr introducing a communication middleware now that we have established how it basically works? The consequences are important to consider because you cannot just develop uh, an application and uh, distribute objects as you like. You need to be careful um, when selecting 
the the places, the spots uh, for remote communication. For example, building a distributed system because of the third reason we mentioned before, because of the non-functional requirement, because you need to achieve scalability, because you need to be uh, reliable in your system setup. You should be very careful to select the interfaces on which you introduce remote communication. Remote communication is by an order of magnitude slower and it has negative consequences not only on the performance and the latency delay um, but also on error handling. Remote communication introduces a whole set, a whole class of potential errors that need to be dealt with in the application logic because you have now many new situations where errors could occur. Imagine your remote object is not available anymore either because the server crashed or because the network is unavailable. You need to deal with those situations that you didn't have before when you have a, an application only running on one host. Either the complete application failed or it just worked. With the introduction of remoting middleware, the failure could also lie uh, in the middleware itself. And in every case, you need to define how your application has to react on any failures in between. It's interesting to see that currently, or more recently, um, a trend has started to be uh, important that basically makes component boundaries and remoting boundaries more explicit than before. If you look at Corba, then the idea was to have remote objects basically look the same as if they were local. You couldn't distinguish a local call from a remote call, except by that it might be slower and, and raise a couple of more exceptions. Um, if you look at more recent middleware implementations like for example uh, Windows Communication Foundation called Indigo a while ago or like the service oriented uh, approach to software development then you know in the application logic that you call a remote component. You, you have this remoting or this component boundary made much more explicit um, and that's interesting to see because um, a while back people tried to make things simpler by uh, hiding remoting complexity and now people try to make things simpler by making <laughs> this uh, remoting aspect uh, explicit. Um, yeah, probably in a couple of years the opposite trend is going to show up again. Another important uh, topic is the extension of middleware. Um, the extension of the, for example, third-party remoting middleware when you need to integrate additional functionality or when you need ex to exchange certain uh, functionality. All three examples that we discuss here, so Corba, Web Services and .NET remoting implementations, they allow the extension of the middleware. The primary mechanisms to achieve that are invocation interceptors and protocol plugins. Invocation interceptors allow you to intercept data, to intercept requests and responses in the data flow of the call stack. This can be anywhere in the call stack, very low uh, at a serialized byte stream uh, level or actually just before dispatching. It depends on what you kind of application functionality you want to integrate. Um, for example, in the case of security, when you need to introduce encryption, it's a good idea to use an interceptor that's pretty low in the call stack, basically one that operates at a serialized byte stream level. And an example for the higher level ones could be transactions, right? So you have some transaction ID on the client and you have to make sure this ID is uh, transported, so you insert the transaction ID into the request using an invocation interceptor. It's transported over to the server where another invocation interceptor takes this ID and makes sure the request is executed in the context of a certain transaction. Usually you have the, a pair of interceptors. You have one that does something on the client and then you have the one that does something that's compatible with the client interceptor on the yeah. server side. Another way of uh, extending the middleware is protocol plugins. So, for example, if you want to run Corba middleware over TCP IP um, in the one uh, instance and uh, in other cases you want to run Corba over 
some not so well known uh, embedded middleware uh, embedded network protocols like for example the CAN bus or something like that then you should be able to exchange the protocol implementation inside the middleware so you'll still be able to use the same middleware but it uses a different co transportation protocol in .NET remoting for example you can either select uh, an XML based uh, transport protocol or binary one that serializes the data into um, yeah bits and bytes and not into readable human readable <laughs> XML. Remoting middleware is uh, very often used in combination with component and application servers, and there the separation of concerns is typically that the container is responsible for all the lifecycle uh, issues of the objects of the components, uh, the services deployed on an application server and the communication middleware is responsible for transmission of the requests and the responses. In early days, for example in Corba, the there was a very lightweight container, the portable object adapter, which took over the lifecycle management tasks. It was responsible for instantiating and evicting COBA objects if it wasn't done uh, manually. So related uh, patterns here are the lifecycle manager and all the resource management patterns such as leasing, evictor, eager and lazy acquisition to manage the instantiation and eviction of remote objects. The detailed explanation of all the resource management patterns follows in a later episode on resource management patterns uh, introduced by POSA 3. Okay, so the final thing that needs to be discussed in the context of remote communications middleware, RPC style, is asynchronous communication. So that means even if you have um, basically an RPC style middleware, you can still execute asynchronous remote procedure calls. So it's not that we now go over to a messaging middleware, we still use RPC but now we have asynchronous APIs. So what does that mean? For example, there is something we termed fire and forget. You can basically um, invoke methods one way, so you call an operation, the client infrastructure, in this case the um, requester and the client request handler, sends away the invocation. It puts it basically onto the wire and then it doesn't care anymore. If the client gets lucky, the request is transported over the network to the server where the invocation reaches the target object and some operation is executed. But it might also just fail. It might uh, not be transported by the IP infrastructure, it might get stuck in the server, the server might have crashed and you don't even notice. So fire and forget as its name implies, it's just you you call a method and you hope that it's being executed. And of course this is performance wise quite good because the client as soon as it has put the request onto the wire it doesn't care anymore. Michael, do you want to uh, explain sync with server? Yeah, sync with server uh, is also one-way semantics, but it is more reliable as uh, fire and forget. And the, the reason why it is more reliable is because the server implementation of the remote communication framework notifies the client-side implementation as soon as the request arrived on the server side. This is before the request is actually dispatched to the remote object, so the client doesn't have to wait till the, the request is executed, but it can be sure that the request reached the server side properly and that no network error or um, error in the server application or unavailability of the server application influenced its remote invocation. So the, the, the previous two patterns, fire and forget and sync with server, were basically only uh, useful for void methods that didn't throw any exceptions because there was no way of reporting back the return value of the operation or a potential application exception. So if you want to do useful or more sophisticated asynchronous communication, then you have to have a way of how this is reported back. And there are two ways of doing that. One is what we call the result callback. So um, the idea is that if the client uh, calls the remote operation, 
it passes in an object on which the middleware calls yet another operation once the result has arrived from the server. So the client invokes the operation, passes in a callback object, the middleware receives the call and directly returns so the client can go on doing something else. And then the middleware uh, forwards the message or the, the invocation to the server. On the server, the object uh, receives the message, receives the method invocation, does something, returns some return value that is transported back over the middleware infrastructure to the client. And now the client middleware receives this uh, return value asynchronously and then calls the callback operation on the object which the client had provided to the middleware when it issued the request. And uh, that way the client can have done something else in the meantime and is now notified that the result has arrived. Of course this uh, requires an event-based programming style because a uh, result callbacks from uh, any kind of remote invocation that has been done before can appear in the client program at any time. It's also not guaranteed that the order of the callbacks is the same as the order in which you did the invocations originally. Another one is the poll object, Michael? The poll object is similar to the result callback in the sense that it's also asynchronously notified of the arrival of the response. And uh, the difference is that the poll object does not execute any application logic instantly as the, the result callback does, but the poll object needs to be polled uh, by the client application whether the result is already available and uh, therefore you would use a poll object when you need to keep your regular control flow and when you don't want to switch uh, to a event-driven programming model. Okay, so I think we have two or three more patterns in the book, but we don't uh, go into details here. Um, so, so this concludes our recollection of the um, of the patterns that make up remoting infrastructures. And as we said before, CORBA, .NET Remoting, Web Services, and basically all other remote procedure call infrastructures are built along those patterns. Um, so if you want to build your own one, you can now take this knowledge and, and go along and, and build your own middleware and maybe just understand existing middleware infrastructures better. To give you two proof points that uh, those patterns aren't something we came up with but are rather uh, mined from real systems, we'll now take a look at how those patterns are implemented in uh, CORBA and .NET Remoting. Michael will start with the uh, explanation of CORBA. In the following I will explain a typical CORBA implementation based on the just introduced uh, patterns. To get started, I will explain uh, some CORBA terminology first. That is, um, on the client side, we typically have a client proxy uh, on top of the op core. Um, the client proxy is typically generated um, from the interface description. On the server side, we have the remote object, uh, which is adapted uh, by a so-called skeleton that is also generated by the by an interface description. And uh, below that, we have the portable object adapter acting as kind of a dispatcher and lifecycle manager. Uh, below that, we have the server side op core. The client specific op core parts implement the patterns requester and client request handler, uh, while the server specific op core part uh, implements the server request handler. Both sides uh, have uh, also a marshaller that is responsible for the serialization and deserialization uh, of the data. The marshaller gets used by the client proxy and the uh, server side uh, skeleton. The server side skeleton, uh, together with the portable object adapter, uh, act basically as invoker, as we just described. Interception of the call flow is typically done on the client side in the stub and on the server side in the power or the skeleton. Depending on whether interception is done before or after serialization by the marshaller, the interceptor can provide a serialized data stream or individual parameters on interception. 
As mentioned before, the Power is responsible for the lifecycle management of the remote object implementations, um, so it can be configured using a large variety of uh, settings and specialized handlers uh, to deal with activation and deactivation of the remote objects. Regarding asynchronous invocations uh, following the poll object or the result callback patterns, it is important to know um, that the server-side op core uh, is totally oblivious. It can be totally oblivious of that asynchrony. Both patterns, poll object and result callback, uh, can be implemented using client-specific op core parts only. Uh, this is nice because it avoids complicating the already complex server-side part of all implementations that uh, are typically highly optimized regarding concurrency and resource utilization. In Corba, both asynchrony models are supported through the so-called asynchronous method invocations. Those are defined in the so-called uh, messaging specification. In .NET Remoting, the patterns are also implemented along the same lines. Um, from 10,000 feet, as usual, a client talks to a remote app object, and this remote object is hosted by what we call a server application. Um, technically, the client proxy is then represented by a combination of what .NET calls the transparent proxy and the real proxy. The real proxy also plays the role of the requester and um, uh, makes sure that the calls are wrapped in an object that can be transported over the network, whereas the transparent proxy resembles the interface of the remote object on the client side. The reason why those two are separated is because the transparent proxy is actually dynamically gener generated at runtime from the interface of the remote object, whereas the real proxy um, is um, something that's generic and can be reused over applications. The rest of the uh, infrastructure on the client side is built um, as a chain of so-called sinks. A sink is basically something that accepts data and does something with it and um, spits out the data on the other side. So there is typically a number of sinks chained together and those build the infrastructure on the client side. The nice thing is that you can add uh, additional sinks which then basically play the role of the invocation interceptors. There are two predefined sinks. One is called the formatter sync and the responsibility of this one is to transform the logical object that's trans that uh, captures request into a byte stream or an XML stream. Actually, there is implementations for binary transports and XML-based transports. So this plays the role of the marshaller. Uh, one level below, there is the channel sync, and the channel sync basically plays the role of the, pro of the protocol plugin. So it's responsible for providing the transport mechanism itself. And then, of course, below that, there is the .NET, ru .NET runtime, which plays a uh, basically the role of the client request handler and um, handles the, the, the low-level communication issues. On the server side, things have basically the same structure. So again, there is the .NET runtime, and going the, call, uh, the stack upwards, there is again a channel sync, which uh, uh, does all the networking stuff. Then there is another formatter sync, which um, plays the role of the marshal or unmarshalling a request, and then you can, as we said before, add a number of other sinks that play the role of invocation interceptors. By the way, you can add your own sinks um, at various locations in this chain. You can add it uh, before the formatter sync or after the formatter sync, which allows you to intercept the request as an object if you do it before the formatter sync, or you can also intercept the raw serialized data, binary or XML if you build your interceptor into the chain after the formatter sync. There is one special sync, which is called the dispatcher sync, which is basically the invoker and the lifecycle manager, and it delegates the remote invocation to the target remote object. So a client's method invocation on the remote object is basically technically made on the transparent proxy, which builds a request object and forwards it to the real proxy. It inserts it into the uh, chain of syncs. So the first sync sync uh, that will get the object is the formatter sync and it will build a serialized data structure. It then forwards it to the channel th sync which handles the networking issues. On the server side the data stream is accepted by a channel 
sync, another channel sync, which uh, forwards it to the formatter sync, which demarshals the data into the request object and forwards it to the dispatcher sync. The dispatcher, playing the role of the invoker, uses reflection to invoke the specific operation on the re remote object. A couple of sentences on um, lifecycle management. There are two fundamentally different kinds of life cycles in .NET. One is what we call the server-activated instances. That means the server application is responsible for creating and destroying remote objects. There are several ways. One is the so-called per-request instance. That means that for each request of the client, there is a new instance created. This uh, requires stateless objects, obviously. Then there is the static instance, which means that the instance is created explicitly by the server application and also destroyed explicitly, typically at the beginning and at the end of the application server application's lifetime. And then there is the lazy acquisition, which is basically the same as static instance, but it's lazily uh, created as soon as the first request from a client arrives. The other strategy of lifecycle management is client-dependent instances. In that case, um, the client is responsible for creating the remote object explicitly. It's also responsible for keeping it alive by extending its lease time. Um, we'll talk about leasing in later episodes about uh, resource management. The interface description in .NET Remoting is achieved by using .NET Interfaces, a construct that is native to the .NET platform. There is no special interface definition language. Asynchronous communication is also available in .NET, although it's not specific to the .NET Remoting. It's uh, generally available in the .NET platform using what they call delegates, which is um, kind of strongly typed function pointer. And um, as in Corba and uh, in most other middlewares, the asynchronous communications aspects are handled exclusively on the client, so the server implementation is not affected by asynchronous calls. So what .NET supports is um, poll objects. You, 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 you call an operation on a specific delegate and the result is what they call an instance of the iAsync result uh, type on which you can poll for the result. Another possibility is using result call callbacks. Uh, you have to pass in uh, uh, an object on which um, .NET can do the callback and finally, you can also use one-way operations by using an uh, annotation .NET attribute uh, called one-way on uh, operations uh, in the interface. So before we finish off this episode, we should also take a look at uh, Microsoft's even newer technology for remote communication, which is uh, called Indigo or Windows Communications Foundation. It's basically a component-oriented uh, distribution middleware. The core concepts are ports, which are basically network endpoints, message handlers, which is a piece of application logic basically, and channels, which connect ports to message handlers. We can map our patterns to this new technology also. Channels basically fulfill the role of the requester and also the invoker, and they can also be configured with additional behavior such as transactions or security, so they also play the role of the invocation interceptor. Ports play the role of the client and the server request handlers, whereas the remote object is something uh, is implemented as part of the message handler that sits at the far end of the channel. So, um, as you can see, even Microsoft's newest technology can be described with our patterns and it it helps to understand the patterns to understand middleware. It's probably not going to change um, um, over the next uh, couple of implementations of middleware. The patterns will probably still be the same. So, this concludes this episode. Um, something that we didn't talk about in this episode is the efficient and scalable implementation of network communications and multi-threading and all these kinds of things. We'll uh, planning on uh, creating a set of episodes on concurrency and all those related topics and we'll cover these things there. So thanks for listening and see you next time. This was another episode of Software Engineering Radio. The Software Engineering Radio team wants to thank Henning Pauli for providing the music, as well as Lipson.com for hosting and bandwidth. For more information on the podcast, past episodes and feedback, 
go to se-radio.net. <laughs>